Welcome to Swallowfield Chapel. We are so happy you could join us. My name is Dominique. Our speaker today is none other than Pastor David and the title of this week's message, Free at Last. Don't forget to share the link with your family and friends and subscribe to our YouTube channel. God bless you as we worship together. Good morning, Swallowfield. Come on, worship with us. It's been so good to be in the house of the Lord. We're going to have a good time this morning. Sing with us. Higher than the mountains that I face. Stronger than the power of the grave. And constant in the trial and the change. One thing.
never fails. Yes, God, you're sure and true. Thank you, Lord. We worship you this morning. We invite your presence into our homes, Lord God, into our lives. We thank you that you are mighty and that you are great. You are on your throne, God. You are the word at the beginning. One with God, the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation. Now revealed in you are Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus, you didn't want, you didn't want heaven without us, so Jesus, you brought heaven down, my sin was great, sin was great, your love was greater, why could Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are, who you are in our lives. We thank you, Lord, that we can raise a hallelujah every day that we rise. Lord, we bring before you our sick. Lord, you know them by name. You know every strand of hair on their heads. Father God, we ask for healing. Maybe not healing in the way we would like, but your healing, Lord. Lord, you see and you know all things. 
We ask, Lord, just as you heal the, the sick and the blind and you raise the dead, that, Lord, you will do what only you can do with the sick amongst us. Lord, we pray for those who are grieving, who have lost loved ones, who have lost husbands and children and parents. Lord, you know the pain as you wept for Lazarus. Lord, we ask that you'd be their comforter, that, Lord, you would shield them and protect them and give them the strength to, you know, prepare for the funeral and all the different arrangements that happen when one passes. We ask, Lord, that you would cover them under your bosom. Lord, we pray for the nation of Ukraine. Lord, none of this has taken you by surprise. But Lord, we ask that by your outstretched hand, you would cover those, especially our brothers and sisters in Christ. We ask, Lord, that you'd cover them as only you can. We pray, Lord, that you'd shield them from the missiles and the, the guns that are firing and the tanks that are blazing. Lord, we ask that you would put your shelter over them, that Lord, though they are in deep distress, Lord, we can only imagine you know, we sit here comfortably, but we can only imagine what they're going through. But Lord, you see and you know. Lord, we ask that you would just guard them, Lord, protect them. Let them know that you have them in the palm of your hands, that this has not taken you by surprise, that you are covering them, that you are shielding them, that you're protecting them. Lord, we pray for Russia. Lord, we pray for the president. Lord God, we ask that you would visit him that, Lord, he would come to know you as Lord and Savior, and he would recognize what is happening is not of you, Lord. That, Lord, there are human beings just like him. That, Lord, there are children, there are women, there are the elderly. Lord, there are families that are in such distress. Lord, we just ask that you would do only you can, what you can do. We ask, Lord, for an outpouring of your spirit, upon Ukraine and the people of Russia. We pray for the soldiers, Lord, young men who we have heard have been have to be put on the battlefield. Young men who have probably never held a gun in their lives. Lord God, we ask that you cover them. We know that their parents must be so worried for them. Lord, we ask that you just cover and that, Lord, you just put a cease to this war. Put a cease to this unnecessary war, Lord. It is not your will that we should be fighting and striving and killing one another for what? Lord, we ask that your peace, your peace, your Holy Spirit would cover the nation of Ukraine and of Russia, the people, the leaders, the pastors, and all those of influence. Lord, we just commit our rest of our day to you. We commit our week to you. We ask, Lord, that you'll continue to guide us Continue to protect us, shield us, show us what it is you would have us do. Cause us, walk, cause us to walk in the steps that you have set out before us. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for everything. Everything is from you. So we bless your holy name. In Jesus we pray. Amen. We worship you, Lord. There is none like you. You are a firm foundation. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus. Name. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy
The scripture reading is taken from Galatians 3, verses 26 to the end, and then I'll continue in chapter 4, verses 1 to 7. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, and here is according to the promise. What I am saying is that as long as an heir is under age, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also, when we were under age, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. This is the word of the Lord. Warm greetings. We continue today our reflections from the book of Galatians. Last week, Sunday, we took a break from these studies as we celebrated communion. I believe that what we share from the book of Galatians on the subject of freedom is particularly relevant and applicable to what is happening in our world today. Our world is in crisis, in distress and turmoil. And the big question is, where do we look for answers? Where do we look for hope and where can we find freedom? I want to suggest that freedom and hope is in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul writes this letter to the churches he founded in Galatia, which were being infiltrated by Judaizers. These were Jewish adherents to Judaism who are undermining both the gospel proclaimed by Paul, the message of Paul, as well as Paul, the messenger himself. And Paul's message was essentially one of freedom. And the freedom, this freedom Paul claimed could only be experienced by faith in Jesus Christ who died for our sins, to rescue us from this evil age according to the will of God the Father. Jesus, according to Paul, was raised from the dead. And so salvation, therefore, rested entirely on the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's entirely a work of God's grace, a work of his kindness and unmerited favor to sinners and should be received by faith in Christ alone. The message of the Judaizers, however, was that, that, that you had to obey the requirements of the Mosaic Law and Code as interpreted by them in order to be saved. The sad truth was that the Galatian Christians were accepting the teachings of these Judaizers and they were being thrown into confusion. And according to Paul, they were being bewitched by these Judaizers. They were being fooled up. In Galatians 3, Paul advances, and this is what we reflected on the last time we spoke from Galatians, he advances three arguments to refute the claims of the Judaizers that salvation required the observance of the Mosaic law. These were, the first argument is the experiential argument found in verses 1 to 5. Paul speaks to their personal experience. The second one is the scriptural argument, and that's found in verses 6 to 14. And the last one is a legal argument found in verses 15 to 29 and onwards. Let's look again briefly at the experiential argument. Paul asks the Galatians to examine their personal experiences and answer the question whether they had received the Holy Spirit as a result of following the Mosaic law or whether it was as a result of their faith in Jesus Christ. Their experience had clearly demonstrated that they had received the Spirit of God by believing in Jesus Christ. They had experienced the power of God. They had witnessed the working of miracles in their lives as a result of their faith in Jesus Christ. So Paul says, why then are you reverting to human effort in order to attain your goal? Oh, foolish Galatians, a who are fooling up, a what on an idiot. But Paul does not rest this case for the truth of the gospel on the subjective personal experiences of the Galatians alone, but goes on to demonstrate objectively from scripture that the argument of the Judaizers was false. And that brings us to the scriptural argument. And Paul argues from scripture that salvation was always, 
always by faith in God. He argues that long before the law came into being, salvation was by faith. As such, Abram, the great patriarch, the father of the Jewish nation, the scripture tells us, believed the Lord and God credited it to him as righteousness. Put another way, God put to Abram's account God's righteousness. How? On the basis of his faith in God. And as a result, those who believe in God like Abram are likewise treated by God and are therefore Abram's children. Paul also points out that the gospel was announced to Abram in advance, that all nations will be blessed through you. And so the Jews therefore had no exclusive right to salvation. It was the plan of God from the very beginning that through them, he would bring his savior, Jesus Christ, into the world and bring his salvation to the world. Jesus come for all, for all nations. Paul continues in verse 10 of Galatians 3 to point out the futility, just the, 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 the futility of trying to gain salvation by observing the law. He makes the powerful point that if one breaks one of the laws, you have effectively broken all of them and you are subject to a curse. Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Deuteronomy 27, verse 26. We were all therefore as human beings under a curse because of our sin and inability to keep God's law. So big question, how then can a man or woman be saved? And Paul answers it in verse 11 of Galatians 3 in this way, the righteous will live by faith. And so there's therefore an incompatibility of trying to live by the law and the way of faith. The man who does these things, trying to keep the law, will live by them, we are told in Leviticus 18. You see, the law stressed doing or human effort. The law says, do and live, but God's grace says, believe and live. Is there somebody who can say, yes, thank you, Jesus, I believe and I'm now living? Jesus Christ has liberated us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Jesus, the sinless son of God, submitted himself to a shameful, horrific, despicable death on the cross for you and me. He accepted the curse due us. The scripture says, curse is everyone who is hung on a tree. He did that to free us from the curse over our lives, but it never ended with his death. God raised him from the dead, vindicating him and his offering for sins as acceptable to God and as such. When we believe in Jesus, we are invested with the righteousness of God. Is there praise the Lord? In Jesus, we therefore have full freedom and it's all by God's grace. And Paul tells us that the effect of Jesus' redeeming work is that all who put their faith in Jesus experience the blessings God had promised Abram. The third argument Paul advances to show that salvation is by faith and not by works of the law is the legal argument, an, an argument he describes as an argument from everyday life. Verses 15 to 29 of our text, and in fact our reading today, which carried us into chapter 4, verse 7, is an extension of this argument. And Paul argues that in, in, in normal human relations, only the parties to a contract can properly vary the terms of their contractual arrangement, their covenant. No one else properly can. In similar matter, manner, therefore, the covenant which was made between God and Abram and to your seed or offering, meaning Jesus Christ, can only be altered, set aside, or varied by these parties which note did not include Moses. The promises made under that covenant cannot therefore be set aside or varied by the law, which was given through Moses, who was not a party to the original covenant, and which law was given all of 430 years after God's covenantal promises were made to Abram and his seed, that is Jesus. The point is this, the law cannot set aside or vary the covenantal promises of God. And Paul goes on in Galatians 3 to explain the purpose of the law, which was given to Moses. So it's captured in verse 24 of Galatians 3 as follows. The law was put in charge to lead us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. 
The law and the promises of God are therefore not opposed to each other, but they are complementary. God sent the law. Understand why he sent the law, to confront us with our sinfulness. The law is like a, a mirror, plainly reflecting our failings and our sinfulness and our need. And like a schoolmaster, it's like a schoolmaster pointing the failing students to their need of a savior. The law leads us to Christ. That is the purpose of the law. The law cannot save you. In light then of the provisions of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ, we are therefore no longer, Paul says in verse 25 of Galatians 3, under the supervision of the law. And through faith in Jesus Christ, all can now come into and experience the abundant life which God offers. Paul says, and I read again from our text today, Galatians 3.26, he says, You are all now sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. He says, there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abram's seed and heirs according to the promise. Paul declares that all who put their faith in Christ Jesus are sons of God, children of God. Now, the term sons of God is loaded. It has nothing to do with gender or sex. It means that a person is one of Abram's seed, children because of union with Christ, who is the seed of Abram. Being a son of God is a special promise by God. It describes that special relationship of intimacy that, that the people of God can have with God. In Paul's letters, the word son is especially related to both Jews and Gentiles who have been set free from the law who now have lived by faith in Jesus Christ and in the spirit of God's glorious freedom and who await God's final redemption. We look forward to Christ's coming. Those are the children of God. So my point is the last thing on Paul's mind when he used the term son was not manliness or masculinity. And as Abram see, the believer becomes heirs according to the promise. That is a beneficiary as a full-grown son in that particular culture of the inheritance granted by his father. So let me illustrate it this way. Faith in Jesus Christ, we become sons of God, children of God, Abram's seed, sons or daughters, and heirs of the promises of God. And Paul further explains and illustrates the connection I've just referred to by, by, by reference to the human institution of a son becoming an adult male and as an adult male inheriting the father's promise. And we'll discuss that analogy which he uses shortly. But let's look again at Galatians 3, 26 to 28. You'll notice that Paul emphasizes the universalism of God's salvation to those who put their faith in Jesus. He says, all are sons of God. All are baptized into Christ. We are all, all one in Christ Jesus. The Judaizers had, however, confined God's acceptance to Jews or those who would join Judaism by following the works of the law. But Paul declares that God accepts us all on the basis of faith in Christ. Is there praise the Lord in your house? Thank you, Jesus. In Christ, there are therefore no racial, social, cultural, or sexual distinctions as the basis for our acceptance by God. As we say in Jamaica, at the foot of the cross, the ground level. And we are all accepted by God on the basis of faith in Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. In Galatians 3.27, Paul points out that this faith is expressed by baptism into Christ and being clothed with Christ. But what does that mean? I want to suggest that it may seem that Paul is suggesting that faith and baptism are parallel, you know, of equal importance. Indeed, some argue that baptism is a means of salvation. On the other hand, many churches treat baptism as a kind of secondary importance, confined to nothing more than a, a means of entrance or an entrance right into the church. But what does Paul teach about baptism? You know, Paul in his writings, he makes a fundamental distinction, difference between external rights, you know, outward acts and internal reality. So, for example, he speaks of circumcision of the heart, 
which makes one acceptable to God versus circumcision of the flesh, which has to do with outward acts. Paul's point is that an external physical act without inner life change does not make one right before God. Let me say it again. An external physical act without inner life change does not make one right before God. And so being baptized without repentance from sin and faith in Jesus Christ is therefore worthless. You go into the water, as we say, oftentimes a dry sinner, but you come out a wet sinner. But having said that, however, baptism in the early church was the initial and necessary response of faith. As one commentator put it, and I agree with him, we dare not make baptism nothing more than a ritual of entrance, for it was for the earliest Christians their first moment of faith. And we know of no such thing as an unbaptized believer. If you're, if you're a believer, you get baptized. So baptism was not necessary for salvation, but faith without baptism was not faith for the early church. Are you working with me? The Galatians knew this, and so Paul appealed to their experience. The early baptism um, ceremony was a public declaration of dying with Christ. You are going down into the water and rising with Christ, coming up out of that water. Romans 6, 1 to 14 tells us this. And essentially, baptism dramatized powerfully the work of salvation and reflected two moral ideas, the putting off of sin and the putting on of a new life. Putting on the new life meant to be clothed with Christ, which was symbolically enacted in the early Christian practice by believer, believers. They had actually strip and, and then re-clothe themselves in a white liturgical robe after the baptismal ceremony. This represented disrobing oneself of sin and then putting on the virtues of Christ. I want to suggest then that to be clothed with Christ essentially means identifying with Christ, finding my identity in him, and to live totally submitted to Christ. In other words, Christ runs my life. He runs things. So can I ask you a question then at this point? Have you put your faith in Jesus Christ? Are you baptized? If not, why not? Christ requires it, not me or the church. It's an initial act of obedience expressing our faith in Christ Jesus. Can I ask you, does Christ have reign of your life? If he does, you should be baptized. Let us explore further what it means to be sons of God, to be in Christ and to be united in Christ. As I said earlier, those who are in Christ Jesus are those who believe in Jesus from all walks of life, from every nation and from both sexes. The Judaizers did not see it this way and felt that Paul was constructing improperly the church by breaking down the line between the Jews and the Gentiles. They saw the need for separation based on race. Even in the temple, the Gentiles had to remain in the outer court while the Jews could go inside. They therefore saw Paul's teaching, they saw Paul's teaching then as madness and heresy. And they perhaps argued this position since God called Abram the father of the Jewish nation, and made promises to him and to his seed, Genesis chapter 12. But Paul shows that faith in Christ destroys such distinction. And Paul plants, as it were, the seed of the gospel, a tree, which would emerge from that seed that has within it three mandates, a cultural mandate, a social one, and a sexual one. You know, scholars have often observed that a Jewish blessing that was prayed daily by some Jews was poss possibly in the first century is here reversed by Paul. And here the blessing that was prayed by Jews in the first century. Blessed be God that he did not make me a Gentile, a non-Jew. Blessed be God that he did not make me ignorant, that is, or a slave. Blessed be God that he did not make me a woman. And what Paul does then is he, he responds to these demeaning classifications of humanity in Galatians 3 and verse 28 by saying, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Christ's work is therefore revolutionary. 
And let's look at each of these mandates or classification and see what it means. Neither Jew nor Greek. This means that to become a Christian does not mean embracing the national identity of the Jews or of any other nation whatsoever. The Apostle Peter and the early church had difficulty in accepting this truth. But Peter was led to minister to the household of Cornelius, a Gentile um, centurion, and he saw God's salvation work firsthand in saving these Gentiles who were baptized in the name of Jesus. As such, eventually, the church at J Jerusalem, they declared, God has granted even the Gentiles repentance unto life. That's Acts 11 and verse 18. And in the declaration that there's neither Jew nor Greek, Paul is affirming, think about it, he's affirming the equality of all peoples, regardless of race or culture before God. Paul is laying, as it were, the ax at the root of exploitation and prejudice and discrimination based on racial or cultural superiority. White supremacy is rejected by Jesus. So is black superiority. Euro Europeans are not superior to Africans, nor Africans to Europeans. Russian supremacy is rejected by Jesus. Ukrainians are equal to Russians and must be treated as such. Blacks and white, as Dr. Martin Luther King says, are equal on God's keyboard. Humanity is equal in God's eyes, and we should treat each other in this way. And embedded in Paul's declaration is the foundation for justice, based on the equality of humanity, all made in the imago dea, the image and likeness of God, which has been affirmed and upheld by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, national pride is good, but not if it is used to put down other nations who are just as valuable to God. The second classification, there is neither slave nor free. I'll give you an example of how that worked in Paul's life. Paul encouraged Philemon, whose slave Onesimus had run away from him, to receive him back as a brother in Christ. Philemon 1.15 says, Paul writes, he says, perhaps the reason, he's writing to Philemon, he said, perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He's very dear to me, Paul writes, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in Christ. What's the point? In Christ, the slave becomes our brother. Both freedmen and slaves have the same spirit and are in the body of Christ. One commentator observed that it was likely that in the early church, slaves were leaders in the church and their owners submitted to them in the context of the church. Paul's declaration of our position in Christ created an atmosphere that would eventually lead to the abolition of slavery. Is there praise the Lord? And with the rising tide of the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 60s in the United States, the entire issue took on new significance for the church. And Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., a Baptist minister, was propelled by the truth of the scriptures to advocate and promote equality for all by way of civil rights for all. And inasmuch as slavery has no place in the church, I want to submit that social classes should have no bearing on this church's work and how we relate as people to each other and in the world. There is neither slave nor free. No blue collar or white collar worker, educated or uneducated, uptown or downtown. The third classification, neither male nor female. By this, Paul is explicitly declaring that males and females are on the same standing before God. Males are not superior to females or vice versa, regardless of what you may think or feel. Women in God's kingdom are not consigned to having children being barefoot and in the kitchen, though being a stay-at-home mom is indeed a worthy calling. And in fact, women occupied positions of leadership in the early church, such as Phoebe and Priscilla, so what am I saying? I'm, let me just summarize Paul's thesis. Faith in Christ Jesus makes us sons, daughters of God. Abram's seed, heirs of the promises of God. The Judaizers wanted the promise of Abram, but they thought that they had to follow the way of the law of Moses 
in order to get to it. But Paul shows that to receive the Abrahamic promise is by faith in Jesus Christ. And he goes on to illustrate his thesis with an analogy from which he makes several applications. What's the analogy? Look at chapter four on. He says, what I'm saying is, is that as long as an heir is underage, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. Verse two, chapter four. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also, when we were underage, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. What's Paul saying? An underage child who is heir of an inheritance is no different than a slave as long as he is a child. He or she must await becoming an adult, the age of majority, before he or she can inherit the estate. And during the period before adulthood, the legal child is subject to guardians and trustees until the father's set time of inheritance. In verses three to seven, Paul applies this analogy to make a point about Israel's history that is almost identical to the point he makes in chapter three, verses 15 to 25. Namely, the childhood period is the period of the law and the inheritance period is a time inaugurated by Jesus Christ. Full rights, that is freedom from the law, do not come until Christ's work is done. The time of the law is a time of slavery. The time of Christ is a time of freedom. What then are some applications from these truths? The first thing is that we will note from verse three is that we were enslaved. Paul says they were enslaved by the basic principles of the world. Another translation puts the elemental spiritual forces of the world. Under the old regime, that is before Christ, BC, before Christ, the law revealed our sin, but it had absolutely no power to enable us to overcome sin. It was as it were the ABC of God's revelation to us. We were still under bondage, imprisoned to sin under the law. Now, the Judaizers hearing Paul saying something like that would have thought he was disparaging the law. But Paul shows that Jesus Christ is the climatic fulfillment of the Mosaic revelation. To use an analogy, let me use an analogy. The law was when we were, as it were, using old time typewriters, you know that? Under which we hammered out the, the ABCs. But now in Christ Jesus, we are experiencing the full expansiveness of the computer age. I wonder if you get my point. We were made, second point, sons of God. Verses four to five of our text. It says this, but when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to, say it with me, sonship. So just as the time is set by the father for the son to receive his inheritance on maturity, likewise does God. When the time had fully come, God sent his son so that the inheritance could be received. The expression fully come is the completion of the basic principles of verse three. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, who lived under the law, though not under sin, and voluntarily took God's judgment, the curse and condemnation due us for breaking the law and redeemed us. As such, Jesus has broken down the barrier between us and God his Father, and between the peoples of the world, between each other, and he has opened the way for us to be adopted as sons of the living God. Let me say it again. Jesus has opened a way for us to be adopted as sons and daughters of the living God. Is there a praise the Lord? That is to experience the full rights and privileges of an adult son who is beneficiary of the inheritance of his father, which is tantamount to governing, as it were, the whole estate. Is there a praise the Lord? <laughs> the third classification, we are heirs. Look at verses six to seven of Galatians 4, it says, because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. 
Being a son of God means having God's spirit living in us, which is the promise given to Abram. You know, in Galatians 3 and verse 14, hear the promise. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abram might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the, what's the promise? The Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God enables the sons and daughters of God to cry out, Abba. And that's an endearing term. It's an Aramaic term for father. It's like saying, Daddy God. It became the special language of Jesus for addressing God, his father. And Jesus' prayer language was, in fact, followed by the early church. And the early Christians saw God as Abba. That was their distinctive mark. It marked them off as the sons and daughters of the living God. If therefore the Galatian Christians are calling God Abba, they are sons of God because the ability to call God Abba is evidence of being a son of God. And because of Jesus, we now have the very presence. Think about it. Think about it. The very presence of God in our lives. His Holy Spirit comes to dwell within you and me, those who trust in Christ, and he empowers us to live for God, and he transforms us to be more and more like Christ. The Spirit mediates the amazing vistas of God's promises to us. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death, we read in Romans 8 and verse 2. I am no longer a slave to fear. I'm no longer a slave to sin or to Satan. I am a child of God. The inheritance of God is mine. Is there a hallelujah in your house? Praise the Lord. <laughs> so Paul's argument and spiritual logic is powerful and refutes the claims of the Judaizers. Since believers have God's inheritance by faith in Jesus Christ, they do not need to live out the works of the law. The Judaizers are therefore wrong in urging what really amounts to a kind of nationalistic powerless and effective view of God's work based on obeying the Mosaic code, which we could never keep, which only revealed our sin, but could not empower us to live free of sin and fulfill God's plans and purposes for our lives. On the other hand, in Christ, there is liberty. Let me say it again. In Christ, there is what? Liberty, freedom. There is freedom to be all that God intended for my life and your life. And I take the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as he said, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, I am free at last. Amen. Let's pause for reflection as we consider what we have heard today from, what, from God's word. What can we take from our message today? As I thought about it, I said, you know, the first thing that came to me was thanksgiving. Thanksgiving for the gift of God's Son and our amazing, great salvation. And I believe we need to celebrate our redemption, being made fully free in Jesus Christ. Another application, I believe, is that we need to affirm and thank God for our new identity in Christ. In Jesus, we are sons and daughters of God. We are heirs of Abram. We have the gift of the Holy Spirit. I believe another application is to commit to grow in, in intimacy with Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to live totally submitted lives. Would you agree with me? To the Holy Spirit. And to be more like Christ, fulfilling God's plan and purposes for our lives. And that includes sharing, sharing the grace and freedom that comes through Christ, which we have received. Share that grace and freedom and say, this is the way, walk in it. Share it with others. Be an ambassador for Christ. Be a disciple maker, helping others to know Christ. I believe more and more, even in these times of trouble and, and difficulty and stress and hardship, we need to evangelize. We need to be baptized, tell people to be baptized and to obey all that Christ has commanded by the power of the Spirit. As individuals and Christian community, we need to model the freedom, the equality and justice of God's kingdom and advocate for and promote God's freedom, equality and justice in our world. And if you don't know Jesus yet, you need to be saved. If you are a Christian and not yet baptized, it's time to be baptized. Follow him as a disciple and open your lives to the filling of his Holy Spirit. 
Let us pray as we close. Thank you, Lord, that I'm no longer under the curse of the law. Thank you that at the right time, you sent Jesus to take our penalty and to become a curse for us so that we can be free by faith in Jesus. Hallelujah. What a savior. Thank you, Lord, that I am no longer a slave to sin. And I ask you, Lord, to forgive us, cleanse me, help me to live out this freedom and to clothe myself daily, Lord, with Christ. May I grow, may we each grow to be more and more like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, that as your children, we all enjoy the privileges of sonship. As Gentiles, we can call you Abba Daddy. As your children, we all have your same spirit and have equal standing before you. Thank you, Lord, that our gender, race, class, educational level, employment status, shade of skin, hair type, abilities or disabilities do not make any difference in our value or standing in your kingdom. Thank you, Lord. And we ask you to forgive us for misrepresenting you when we have joined in with the world and valued others and ourselves based on these false ideas. We repent and ask your Holy Spirit who lives in all of us to break us, uh, to help us to break down these walls that divide us and to be one as the Godhead is one. Lord, this divided world more than ever needs a united church. Help us as your ambassadors to confront and dismantle these inequalities wherever we encounter them and especially in ourselves. As your heirs, Lord, we commit to gratefully share this good news of your salvation with those who are still on the curse of sin and death. We commit to making disciples of Jesus by helping other believers to grow into your likeness as together we submit to your plan and purpose for our lives. Help those of us, Lord, who are not baptized to take that step as soon as possible. And those who need discipleship, Lord, to receive it and the more mature believers to give it. May we be and make disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we can do none of this in our own efforts. So we ask you, O oh, Almighty God, to fill us again with your Holy Spirit, who frees us to be and do all you desire of us. We embrace this freedom by faith in Jesus' name. Amen. And Amen. I believe that some of us who are listening today may not know this Jesus who offers freedom and hope and you'd like to receive Christ. If you'd like to receive Christ today and submit to his rule in your life and experience his freedom, I wonder if you could just pray this prayer with me to the Lord from your own heart, giving him your heart and your life. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for speaking to me today. I ask you to forgive me of my sins and I invite Jesus Christ to be the leader and ruler of my life. Fill me, Lord, with your blessed Holy Spirit and help me to say, help me to be able to say, Abba, Father, thank you for your salvation, Lord. I pray, Father, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. I want to encourage us to continue to pray for what's happening in our world. We know what is happening in Ukraine and Russia and so on. And let us not be remiss in lifting up these nations and, and, and the situation in our world that cries out more and more even now for the people of God to arise as God's salt and light and ambassadors of hope and freedom in our world. Let us join in a song of worship, after which I will do our benediction. Oh
Let us now share our benediction. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. God bless you. To receive personal confidential prayer, call, email, or text WhatsApp or call us today up to 11.30 a.m. at 876-521-9437 or 876-877-9794. And for mail callers only, please reach out at 876-371-0898 or email your request to prayer at swallowfieldchapel.org or by text at 876-395-7694. Visiting with us for the first time? Welcome! We invite you to complete the contact card in the link below to connect with us. God bless you. Thank you for giving in these troubled times. We invite you to continue to give as the Lord enables you to support our ministries and those in special need. Here are a few convenient ways to do so. You may deposit your tithes and offerings in the drop box at the church office at number 7, Mondays to Fridays from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Tithes and offerings can also be done by direct online deposit to our Swallowfield Chapel BNS New Kingston current account, account number 804161, branch number 50575, or you can log on to swallowfieldchapel.org and click Give to make your direct online contribution. Financial contributions for food care packages should be so indicated.
In-person services are now hosted in the sanctuary at number 9 Swallowfield Road at 8 a.m. And please note that our second in-person service will now be held at a new time of 10.30 a.m. No registration is required. All COVID-19 protocols, including physical distancing, are observed. Parents, Zoom Sunday School continues each Sunday from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. Contact Catherine Preston at swallowfieldchapel.org or call 876-525-5562 to register your child today. Hey, Swallow fam, Meetup invites you to join us this Monday at 8 p.m. for Meetup Mondays on Zoom. We want you all to be a part of the conversation as we continue our series studying the Book of Romans. Look out for the link. You won't want to miss our Believers Meeting Lenten series titled Cross It, Eliminating the Things That Entangle, this and every Thursday through to Easter at our usual time of 6 p.m. Click, share the link, invite a friend, and come join us. Arise, our women's ministry continues its I've Come Alive, New Freedom in Christ series on Fridays at 6.30 p.m. via Zoom. The speaker will be Grace Davis, and the topic is It's Just an Emotion. Ladies, this is a not-to-be-missed event. Crossroad begins our brand new series for the month of March titled Questions for God, where we look at doubts and questions. We'll be having three online messages that are posted every Saturday at 6 p.m. And on the 26th, we'll be having our in-person service where we'll be having worship and the word and so much games and fun. And that will start at 5.30 p.m. For all our online messages, you can go to our social media platforms and find them. So that's Crossroad Jamaica on Instagram and Crossroad Swallowfield on YouTube. For any questions about the ministry or how your team can get involved, please contact Matthew by email at alanisaacs at swallowfieldchapel.org or crossroad at swallowfieldchapel.org. Crossroad, where we do life with our teens, ages 13 to 18. Register today for the new season of Divorce Care beginning April 5th and 6th. Click on the link below to register. Panafish, Panafish, get your wire wide. Panafish, big pan, miggle pan, little pan. Place your orders Mondays to Fridays from 9 a.m. Call 876 926 7163, extension 2266, or WhatsApp 876 427 1394. And remember, all are welcome to join us every weekday morning and on Saturdays for our online prayer meeting from 6.30 a.m. to 7.30 a.m. Click and share the link in the description below. Remember to share the link to our online services streamed on Sundays at 9 a.m. with your family and friends at home and abroad. And subscribe to our YouTube channel. For the links to these and other activities, visit swallowfieldchapel.churchcenter.com. And here's a reminder to stay safe. Wear your mask, wash hands regularly, sanitize, and maintain physical distance. May God bless you and keep you always.